uh, I just wanted to uh, mention, we've, I, I think because of, uh, you know, Palm Sunday and then Easter or whatever, I've been wanting to uh, try to talk to you a little bit and ask you to pray for uh, what's going on in terms of the negotiations uh, with uh, the uh, six plus one nations and, uh, and Iran over their nuclear facilities. Keep in mind, these negotiations have been ongoing for 12 years now. <laughs> the whole time they've been going as fast as they can to develop uh, uh, nuclear weapons. We've been involved as a country for the last six years uh, and uh, everything that, um, that we've heard about and of course the, uh, uh, the comments by uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu at the, uh, when he appeared before Congress uh, all appeared to be va very valid uh, concerns. Uh, at the beginning of the negotiations, the idea was to uh, put sanctions on Iran so that they would stop their nuclear program. Uh, when we got involved uh, in the negotiations, the, the last round uh, of them, uh, one of the things we did is uh, lifted the sanctions, a portion of them, and injected several billion dollars into their economy just to get them to the negotiating table. Uh, and now we're, uh, we've uh, they've given up nothing and we've given up a great deal. We're no longer trying to shut down their nuclear program uh, and under the present deal, uh, it's not a good deal. And there's, uh, the concern is there's a very short breakout period from under this deal to where they can have, have the bomb and be ready to go. Uh, it was uh, just um, kind of made public not that long ago that sometime this year, 2015, Iran will be online with, uh, with their, uh, their missile system uh, that will uh, have the ability to deliver uh, uh, warheads to the United States. They've been developing that with uh, North Korea. As uh, one speaker said, North Korea is the Walmart of missiles. You just go and buy whatever you need uh, and they make it uh, readily available to you. Uh, and the whole time I, I, I uh, you know, I understand how badly things are going, uh, but I want to help you understand why they're going so badly and introduce you to this guy right here. Next to our Secretary of State, uh, Kerry, uh, is this uh, man, Raymond uh, Malley. Malley is the lead negotiator, and you need to understand his, uh, his background. Uh, he is very pro-Palestinian. He has written extensively uh, and given uh, great props to, uh, to men like Yasser Arafat, the leader of the former PLO, who was himself a... Uh, a terrorist uh, and a murderer. Uh, while he was working on the Obama administration uh, re-election campaign, uh, they had to drop him off of their team because he was having private meetings with Hamas, uh, again, a, a terrorist organization. This is a guy that is anti-Semitic and he is very anti-Israel and he makes no bones about it. He's spoken about it and he's, uh, he has written about it extensively. Uh, and he's our lead negotiator. With, against the Iranians. So when uh, Netanyahu and other Jewish groups around the world uh, and people that love Israel are concerned over this guy, uh, his position of all people, that's our elite negotiator, uh, and then we get the results that we're getting, it's kind of, okay, this makes sense now. And uh, uh, in terms of why the administration is doing this and uh, literally throwing uh, Israel under the bus, we. Uh, you know, there's all speculation of that, but uh, obviously they don't like them. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, the policies in our own country, it's very clear, they don't really like Christians either. So uh, we kind of uh, are in the same boat together. In terms of a, a biblical framework, the concern is the Abrahamic covenant that God said is eternal and unconditional. It says that I will to, to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'll bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And uh, uh, our, uh, the next uh, 18 months or whatever is, is uh, a very dangerous time for the nation of Israel, uh, and therefore it's a dangerous time for the United States. Uh, if, uh, if this thing goes forward and it gets worse and it gets implemented, uh, we can certainly expect not the blessing of God, but really the, uh, the wrath of God. So we need to really just pray this whole th deal would, will fall apart. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a real concern that we need to be in, in prayer about. But I just thought I, I'd introduce you to this guy, Robert Malley, because uh, it's, as you look at the negotiations and, uh, and the deal that's on the table now, it's, uh, it's no wonder that... Uh, that uh, people are uh, upset over it. This is not just Jewish groups, and it's not just Republicans, it's Democrats as well that are very concerned that uh, that's what happened, what we're doing to our, 
our ally, uh, our only uh, really ally in the Middle East, not just Israel, but Saudi Arabia, because they're, they're very upset as well, uh, and they've already pledged, uh, along with the Gulf states uh, and everything, to uh, begin. They've actually already begun, along with Egypt, uh, the, the run-up to their own nuclear uh, program, assuming that if Iran gets the bomb and they can't be stopped militarily, then the rest of them will have to uh, basically ante up or uh, they'll, they'll be under, under the control of Iran very, very soon. So uh, real concern and uh, certainly encourage you to keep that in your prayers. All right. Well, we're in Ephesians six, uh, 4, excuse me. Uh, do not grieve the spirit of God. And um, you go on to the next slide. Uh, this thing began back in chapter 1 uh, with a word picture that, that, that Paul gave us there uh, in verse 1 uh, where he talks about uh, walking worthy of the calling the word worthy, remember, is that, uh, that word in the Greek that means a, a balance beam. Uh, and so on one side of the balance, you have our walk. You might say our calling. You could say our talk. Uh, uh, but that calling, and we, uh, to live a life uh, of Jesus, for Jesus Christ, uh, what we believe, what we say we believe, and so forth, does it balance with our walk, which, again, is just a metaphor for our life and how we live our life, uh, and that's been the concern. He's talked about the new man, uh, the new nature that we have in, in Christ. Uh, and now he's getting to some very practical terms that basically says, uh, and if you, if you do these things, if you're committing these sins, uh, then you're grieving the Holy Spirit. That's in, that's in verse 10, excuse me, 30. If you want to go ahead and look there, it says, uh, Paul says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, and the root idea of grieve means to cause pain. So again, this speaks of the, the person of, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, and um, the fact that uh, we can grieve or cause pain to the Holy Spirit is a very interesting uh, idea uh, in and of itself. Uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, said that, uh, For it is an inexpressibly delightful thought that he who rules heaven and earth and is the creator of all things, and the infinite and ever-blessed God condescends to enter into such infinite relationships with his people that his divine mind may be affected by their actions. You got, you got all that? This is a, a Spurgeon a few years ago. A little, uh, five, couple of $5 words in there and so forth. But it's an imprisoning. Uh, the God who created everything uh, you and I can affect him by our actions. That's what, that's what you saw, condescending and coming down, coming down to our level that we might uh, know him. It's quite a thing that uh, by our actions, by our words, uh, we can grieve uh, the Holy Spirit uh, of God. Uh, and that ought to be a motivation for, uh, for uh, listening to what Paul has to say here. Uh, it also should be a motivation to, to holiness, uh, if uh, God loves us so greatly uh, that uh, we should then uh, want to uh, live our lives for him as to not grieve him. Uh, if you've had a, and not everybody does, but if you have a great relationship with your mother and father uh, and uh, you love them and they love you and so forth, and I realize that's not always a situation, but if you do, uh, you understand the idea that uh, you don't want to do things that grieve them. You don't want to do things that upset them. You don't want to do things that break their heart, you know, because you love them and, uh, and so forth. Well, to a greater way, uh, that can happen with us in the Holy Spirit. Who has done for us? He's baptized us into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, he sealed us. Paul covered that uh, in, for, in chapter 1, verse 13. He is our counselor, uh, Jesus says in John uh, 14. Uh, and, uh, and Paul says that uh, uh, over in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 6, 9, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Uh, he teaches us, Jesus says in John 16. And so we can either, uh, in a sense, bring a smile to the Holy Spirit or we can grieve his heart uh, one or the other. Now, Paul not, not only tells us how that happens, he actually gives us reasons why we should be doing certain things and, and, uh, and not be doing certain other things, uh, all very important. And the first one is in verse 25, and it's where to speak the truth, uh, again, of chapter 4. Therefore, putting away lying, 
Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members uh, of one another. So we're to speak the truth and put away lying. A lie is a statement that's contrary to fact, spoken with intent to deceive. Uh, it's, it's not to say that uh, uh, I just said we're going to have our uh, missions meeting here at, uh, uh, at uh, 11, 1130, uh, but we don't get started until 1135. I'm not lying. I just, you know, things happen and we got kind of pushed back a little bit. You know, there's no intent to deceive. But when you tell something that is not true with the intent to deceive, uh, that, uh, that is a lie. It was a, it was a big deal in Paul's day in the Greek culture, uh, uh, in the nation surrounding Israel. It was very prevalent. Uh, again, there's so much like uh, first century thinking that is prevalent in our, in our, day, uh, uh, in our culture today. Uh, and we live in a we live in a culture of liars. Uh, and by the way, uh, the the Greek uh, here basically says it says stop lying. It's not like just in case this could maybe happen one of these days to someone out there. Paul's saying to everybody, stop lying, because now we're trying to walk a life that is worthy uh, of uh, of the calling. And we can become so immense in our own culture uh, that. Uh, uh, we can ooze deception and falsehood, as one writer said. Uh, I just got this yesterday, Bill, uh, the uh, Billy Graham uh, magazine decision. The cover story is Lies and, and Consequences. <laughs> and, it's, and, and in it, it just talks about the, the culture that we're in. Uh, it, it's so prevalent. We read about it uh, all, all the time. Uh, one of the cover stories, of course, was about Brian Williams, the, uh, uh, the reporter who fabricated a, a story about uh, being in Iraq and being shot down in a helicopter and so forth. Uh, well, it turns out he was in a, another helicopter that arrived a half hour later. That's close. He saw it, you know, and then he actually said this several times on several different shows, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the fish story kept getting bigger and bigger. As, uh, as it went along, and he was, became very descriptive about seeing the missiles coming at them and, and so forth. And it turns out he fabricated the, uh, the whole thing uh, no longer on the, uh, the nightly news. We had the, uh, uh, the veterans, uh, Veteran Affairs Secretary Robert McDonald uh, had to admit that he was actually never uh, in the special operations. Uh, I give him a little credit, though. He's a, uh, he's a West Point grad, and he, uh, he did uh, go through ra Army Ranger training, but he actually never went into the unit and deployed and so forth. But uh, he had to come out and apologize, uh, apologize for that. We just had the opening day of Major League Baseball, and, uh, and uh, Alex Rodriguez of the Yankees is out there who one time adamantly divide taking, uh, taking steroids and so forth. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, one of the uh, greatest reading from the article here without... Uh, one of the biggest perpetrators of falsehood has been the former professional cycling icon, uh, Lance Armstrong. So it goes through athletes. Uh, it goes through political, political figures. Once in a while, they lie. <laughs> and uh, uh, it mentions uh, uh, David Axelrod's book on uh, Barack Obama, who uh, made a decision uh, when he ran in 2008 uh, not to reveal his, uh, his real, real intent and position on same-sex marriage uh, and came out and said that he was against it uh, until after he was elected the second time and then came out and said that he was a for, uh, for it. Now, he said his position evolved. Axelrod, who was part of his staff, said, no, <laughs> he lied. <laughs> he always held that, uh, that position, and we could, uh, we could go on uh, in business and Wall Street and so forth. Uh, and it's just uh, it's very easy. There's some, actually some shocking statistics about, uh, uh, let me just read one as far as just the average folks here. Uh, again, the book, uh, The Day America Told the Truth, would certainly indicate uh, that uh, according, to, uh, according to the book, 91% of Americans admitted that they lie regularly. And I could go on. 91%. Do you lie? Oh, yes, I do. Nine, nine out of ten Americans. It's part of our culture as well. Uh, the whole point is that it was part of Paul's culture, and he says, stop, stop doing it. Uh, uh, and there's a reason for it. He says uh, uh, that uh, we belong to each other uh, in Christ. Uh, lies, false messages among members actually render the body dysfunctional, and, uh, and it just creates problems. 
Uh, we're part of the body of Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we shouldn't be lying to each other. I should say we shouldn't be lying to anyone else as, as well. Now, I mentioned the negotiation with the Iranians, and the other thing to consider is that according to Islam and the writings of the Quran, you are told and instructed to lie to non non-Muslims anytime you need to to further your cause. It's completely accepted, and you're encouraged to do so. That's kind of a tough group of people to negotiate with right there. Uh, but that's not true of Christians. Uh, very explicit. It's in the Ten Commandments. Repeated here and many other times, uh, we are to stop lying. Secondly, uh, the sin of anger can control us. That's in verse 26 and 27. Uh, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So uh, we say first that anger in itself uh, is not, not a sin. Uh, in your anger, uh, do not sin is from Psalm 4.4. Uh, God is angry uh, very often. If you, just, uh, uh, if you do a little search in a, in a concordance of, of God's wrath or God's anger, it actually comes up quite, quite a bit. Uh, the, we read about the phrases like, and the anger of the Lord in New, uh, Numbers 25, Jeremiah and so forth. Uh, it's part of his judgment that he will bring against uh, nations uh, and people in his anger and in his wrath. The Bible speaks about how his anger can be kindled and compared to a fire. Uh, the Bible talks about Jesus was angry when he cleansed the temple uh, in Mark uh, 11. But again, this is uh, what we might call righteous indignation. Uh, it's angry on behalf of somebody else because of an injustice uh, being, being done to them. Uh, we're thankful that William Wilberforce was an angry man, and he was so angry, he persevered for decades to end slavery uh, in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, I know there was uh, a, a Christian book written uh, a number of years, years ago by the son of, uh, uh, I think it was named in a moment, but it was, uh, it's called A Time for Anger, and it was about the abortion issue. Uh, and there's a, there's a concern that Christians are not angry enough uh, about what goes on uh, in, in terms of, of the abortion issue. We're, uh, we're thankful that uh, a man named Martin Luther was very angry about doctrinal issues that existed in the church. So uh, you, we can be angry about things on behalf of others, uh, but it's easy for that anger to become sin. Uh, so it's one thing to be angry on behalf of someone else. Uh, for them and so forth for a just cause uh, and still be and carry out our actions in a very, uh, very loving way. Uh, but uh, uh, that's uh, one thing he says about anger. Uh, it's possible to have righteous indignation. But uh, secondly, he says, do not prolong the sin of anger. That's in verse 26. Do not let the sun go down on your, on your wrath. <clears throat> Psalm 4.4 4 says, uh, be angry and do not sin. Uh, meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness uh, and put your trust uh, in the Lord. Uh, we can be angry and not sin, uh, but uh, when that sin, when the anger becomes sinful, we need to deal with it. Uh, and, uh, and the sooner, uh, the better. It's not the idea that I just keep it to myself and keep it on a low burn and just hope that, that I, I don't ever kind of verbally explode on on that person or uh, about that situation. Psalm 37, 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes, causes harm. Uh, we probably don't use that word, but we probably do it a lot. Fret. <laughs> probably a lot of fretting going along. Uh, Frederick Beaker, uh, an uh, uh, award-winning Christian author of uh, a generation ago, says, uh, Of the seven deadly sins, anger... Is possibly the most fun to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief uh, drawback is that what you're wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. And that's the problem. It, it, uh, it hurts you more than it does the, the other person. Uh, whether you, you ever let your feelings be known or not, uh, and, um, 
Uh, there's, a, there's a few of us, I might say the majority in this room that's experienced anger before, uh, and it does kind of eat you up and dominate your thoughts, and it can just grow uh, within you and create all kinds of problems. Uh, and here's what Paul says is, is, is the problem and why we should deal with it uh, as soon as we can. You know, don't let the sun go down uh, on your wrath. Again, don't let another day go by uh, without dealing with it, dealing with your own heart. Because he says, thirdly, that the sin of anger will give the devil a foothold into your lives. The word foothold is a military term. We would use the, word, the phrase FOB, a forward operating base today. World War II era, we'd say a beachhead. In other words, don't allow the enemy to come in and establish something something in your life where you're, you've got the anger. He sees you've got the anger. He can come in and establish because now you're in sin and living in sin. Uh, that sin will cut you off to some degree in your relationships with other people, uh, hamper your relationship with God. Uh, it'll sense make you dysfunctional within the body of Christ. Uh, and, uh, and Satan's got a, a foothold in there. And, uh, and he's not satisfied, of course, with just that. He wants to get into your life and have a foothold so he can expand. That's the idea of a, of a forward operating base. You get there so you can set up a command center. It's not so you can just maintain that command center. It's so that you can branch out from there and, and take more territory away from, uh, from your, uh, your enemy. And that's what uh, uh, Satan wants to do with each of us. And um, Esau is a classic example of a guy that, that had the anger that led to bitterness uh, and the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 uh, says this about Esau, verse 15. Uh, uh, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness uh, springing up cause trouble. That's our concern. And by this, many become defiled. It doesn't just affect you, it impacts others around you. Now he goes into his illustration. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Uh, for you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with, with tears. Again, why was Esau rejected? Uh, he seemed to be trying to repent, and, uh, and even the writer says here, with, with tears. Uh, it was because he was bitter in, in his heart. He was an angry man, and... Uh, we went into his life in great detail in our study uh, uh, in, uh, in Genesis. And uh, uh, we said that uh, Esau, basically, we called him Big Red. Uh, and we compared to him. He was like a, a living beer commercial. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's Esau. Uh, he was a self-centered person. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he was willing to trade away his birthright and so forth. Uh, he could have cared less about the things of God. Uh, but later then, when he cried about it, uh, uh, there was no repentance. There was uh, no forgiveness. There was nothing there because he had never dealt with the anger that became bitterness like a root that went down in his own heart uh, and absolutely uh, destroyed his life. Uh, anger, it's a big issue. Paul says there's a time when it's not sinful, but we know it certainly can lead to sin, especially if it's self-centered anger. Uh, not only that, we need to be careful because if we don't deal with it and deal with it promptly uh, in bringing ourselves before the Lord and asking him to help us with the issue, he's not surprised and he knows already. Just tell him, I'm angry at this person, but I need you to take the anger from me. I need to see this from a different perspective. Uh, I got to get a grip on this. Lord, I need a work of your spirit in my life because you, if you don't, then the devil gets in. He's got a foothold and he's not content with just having a little sin in your life, he'll use it to expand. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. If you don't deal with it, it defiles many, not just yourself. Uh, that's our second issue. The third one is stealing. Stealing prevents generosity. We see that in verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that uh, he may have something to give him who has need. So there's a prohibition against stealing. Uh, again, a major problem in our country today. I don't know if you're, uh, you're aware of it, but uh, employees uh, stealing from their employers uh, cost our economy $8 billion a year. That's that billion with, with a B. Um, 
uh, that loss and so forth can be attributed 10% to clerical errors, 30% to shoplifting, but 60% is from uh, employees. Uh, that's $16 million a day in our country where employees steal from their employer. It's very common. I mean, if you guys are out there in the workforce, you're, you're probably uh, aware of it. It includes, uh, uh, again, probably nobody's cracking the safe and taking out, uh, you know, 50000 at night or whatever, but it's padded expense accounts. It's, uh, in uh, inadequate income tax reporting. It's, uh, it's borrowing and forgetting to return. Uh, it's using your employer's time for uh, other things uh, other than work. And again, these are the things that grieve and break the heart of the Holy Spirit uh, and make us very dysfunctional. I mean, the our whole thing is we want to be walking in the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit of God, uh, and that's not going to happen if we're grieving the Holy Spirit uh, through these, uh, these things. Secondly, he mentions there's a perseverance in work that is needed. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is, uh, what is good. And actually, there's, a, there's a, uh, the pronoun there, there's the, the good. There's a the good. Uh, again, in the Ten Commandments, thou shall not uh, steal. Uh, rather, let him labor. Uh, the word labor means to the point of exhaustion. Uh, uh, it's very clear in the Bible. It uh, kind of promotes this idea of what we call capitalism. Every man has a right to earn a living, uh, to use his strength uh, for gain for uh, he and his family. Uh, and God gave uh, numerous laws to the Jews for the protection of uh, uh, property rights and so forth. Uh, many of those that uh, we find in our own uh, our own laws today. But uh, again, there's a, a perseverance that's needed. Uh, in order to get out there in the workplace and, and earn a living. Uh, but it should be even to the point of, of exhaustion. Uh, there's a perseverance there. Uh, there's a priority, third, to do something useful, working with his hands what is good. Here Paul lifts up human labor to a very high level. And therefore, uh, there should be no such thing as a, as a lazy Christian uh, on a job site. If there's two guys or two gals, and they're both doing the, the same job together, the Christian ought to be out working the non-Christian every time. That, that's, that's what's very clear here. Uh, and if you find yourself needing a few more breaks than the other person or whatever, you need to repent. Uh, people ought to know you at work as you're that Christian that works so hard. You know what? If you do it, you'll get heat from your uh, fellow employees. Because I know some of you do. They give you a hard time. Hey, slow down a little. You're going to make us look bad. You know, you, you get that. Do you really have to, you really have to finish all that today? Uh, because uh, otherwise we'll get paid a little extra if we can come back tomorrow. Uh, the, the, that's the kind of criticism that you should be getting uh, in the job site. Uh, Paul elevates this idea of the worth of getting out and, and, uh, and working with your hands. Uh, it's the way God made us and God wired us. I read one, uh, uh, one uh, statistic that I thought was, uh, was very alarming, and that is that uh, uh, most people from, from when they retire, retire, and they stop working, and they stop working and do nothing. That's what I'm talking about. They don't stop this job to go to another job. They don't stop, retire to, you know, go back to college. They don't stop, you know, do something. Else. They just stop working. Uh, the life expectancy is two more years. We, we just don't do well uh, with, with, without working, and, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's important. Every Jewish rabbi uh, was taught a trade. We know Paul was a, was a tent maker. Uh, rabbis taught that if you do not teach your son a trade, you teach him to be a thief. And uh, I'm thankful my, my dad was in the grocery business, and he got us in the grocery business. We, we, we got a trade. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of young guys. They just kind of uh, drift along out of high school and never actually get a trade where they can uh, uh, earn a living. Uh, but it shouldn't be so with, with believers. Moses uh, was a shepherd. Gideon threshed wheat. David uh, minded his father's uh, flocks. Uh, Peter, James, and John were, were all fishermen. And Jesus himself, he lived on unemployment most of the time. No, actually, he was a carpenter. Uh, again, very great examples uh, in the Bible. And then the purpose for work uh, is, uh, is given him here. Uh, it's so that you can have a large 401k. No, actually, it doesn't say that. That he may have something to give him who is in need. So you're working not just for yourself or not just for your own family. 
You're trying to work hard and be frugal so that you could actually bless somebody else. You can't help everybody, uh, but uh, if you set aside a little bit so that when you see somebody in need, you can help them. And, and it, again, in our culture and, and today, you have to be careful with that, uh, who you're helping and why. Uh, when we, uh, uh, I was on staff with Pastor Bill, and we just moved into the Empress Theater, which is, uh, was in downtown Honolulu at the time. Uh, and uh, the, uh, all the folks that lived on the, uh, the streets down there were part of the whole Hotel Street crowd and everything. They were excited, you know, the Christians were going to be coming to their part of the town because they figured they were, they'd be easy to hit up, you know, as far as uh, uh, the whole panhandling thing and stuff. We used to have to hand out flyers to the people in the church explaining why you don't give money to those people because it's just going to be used for drugs and alcohol so, so don't, and crime. So, so don't do it. If you want to help them, you know, help River Alive. Give to them, volunteer. Uh, there, are, there are groups of uh, uh, Christians out there that are, that are doing that. Uh, but uh, again, we work so that we can be generous with, with others. And I, I just have to tell you, it's a, it's a blessing because I become more aware than, than, uh, than most how much you guys do for each other, how you bless each other, uh, take care of each other financially uh, and otherwise. Uh, and I uh, just want to uh, commend you for that. That's exactly what uh, is being said here. James 2.15 uh, says, uh, James writing, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warm and be filled, uh, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? This is a person that doesn't even have uh, enough clothes uh, on their back. Uh, the idea of seeing them in church is the idea. Uh, and just say, Wow, hope I don't have to sit next to that person. And you just say, be warm, be filled, and we'll see you later. Uh, 1 John 3, 7, John writing, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God uh, abide in him? Uh, these things, if we uh, don't do them, if we don't work hard or earn a living, I'm not talking about people that are, don't have the ability to work hard and so forth, uh, sickness and, uh, and different things, that's, that's different. But when we have the ability and we're not doing it, and we resort even on the job and other places, stealing uh, little or big, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 29, we have the corrupt speech does not build anyone up. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, uh, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace uh, to believers. So, Again, corrupt speech comes from a corrupt heart. Jesus said it's out of the heart uh, or the abundance of the heart uh, that the mouth speaks. Uh, unwholesome talk literally means rotten, uh, putrid, and filthy. That's, that's the word. It's a word that's used for something that's, uh, that is rotting away. Uh, it certainly would include obscene language, <clears throat> but the uh, emphasis here is on language and conversation that, uh, that is decaying, uh, that runs others down, uh, that delights in their weaknesses uh, where you highlight them from, from, uh, from others. Again, very, very prevalent uh, in, our, uh, in our culture just to kind of verbally rip, rip into uh, to, to one another. It's one of the issues that's difficult certainly out there in the workforce. Uh, the sinner's mouth is, quote, full of cursing and bitterness, Romans 3.14. But when we trust Christ, we're confessing him as our Lord and Savior. Uh, James has a lot to say about this, of course. Uh, and that's why I encourage you to read, read a proverb every day through the month. You know, you're going to hit, over the course of the month, you're going to get a lot of exhortations about uh, uh, the use of your tongue and, uh, and how it can be used to, to bless or to curse. Secondly, our speech, again, it's just not what we're not to do. It's what we are to do. Our speech is to edify uh, or, or to build up others. Uh, Paul, again, our same writer in Colossians 4, 6 says, uh, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer uh, each one. Salt preserves. It prevents uh, decay. Uh, and our talk should be elevating others, building others up. Uh, Proverbs 12, 18, the tongue of the wise brings healing and it also brings a smile to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we just need to be careful. Uh, our tongues are, are powerful. 
Uh, again, James compares it to the rudder of a ship. He compares it to the bridle that can, uh, in a bit, in a bridle that can control a, a very large, powerful uh, horse. Uh, if you can control your tongue, he says, you can control your whole body. But the way you control your tongue is through the heart. Uh, it's not just, uh, here's the 10 things I'm not going to say today. Here's the 15 things I'm going to try to say today. It's really uh, an issue of the heart. And then five, our behavior can bring sorrow to the Spirit of God. That's in verse 30 and 31. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So uh, I've broken this down to five attitudes and, and one motivation that's here. Uh, the bitterness refers to a settled hostility that poisons the whole inner man. I thought that was a good definition. A settled hostility that poisons the whole inner man. Uh, somebody says or does something to us uh, that angers us uh, and uh, uh, we don't like it and we, we think about it and how it was so offensive to us. And it may have been. Uh, uh, that's, that's, you know, sometimes you say, well, well, yeah, but I deserve to be angry at that guy. Do you know what he did? Well, yeah, that's not really the issue here. It's, it's our response to what they've done. Uh, again, they may have sinned against you, uh, but now it's a question of how to respond to the other person's sin. Do we, do we sin back at them? And, uh, and Paul's saying, know that, uh, know that we shouldn't. Same word is used over in Colossians where it says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter against them. That's, uh, that's the same uh, word there. Again, and, uh, Esau is the, uh, uh, is the same example uh, that I, that I want to use here. Aren't you glad I'm using somebody in the Bible as an example and actually not anyone here in the church? <laughs> so I throw that out a little safer that way. But Esau, again, is an interesting character. The, uh, he, again, somebody that was eaten up with, uh, with bitterness. Uh, we, we get this kind of a wrong idea <coughs> about Jacob, uh, that uh, Jacob was deceitful, uh, just Jacob was full of trickery uh, and so forth. Uh, probably heard that before. Where, where do you get that idea? There's only one person that ever says that in the Bible, and it's never God, Esau. According to Esau, <laughs> Jacob was a a thief. Uh, Jacob was deceitful and so forth. That was the opinion of Esau. The opinion of God of Jacob is very different. Uh, God says of Jacob, Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. God has nothing but good things to say about Jacob. And, and you say, but wait, 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 wait. What was that whole thing where you know, his mother, you know, uh, Rebecca, she, you know, she puts the furry skins on him. She makes, the, uh, makes the, the special lentil soup and she sends him in to get the blessing. Wasn't that kind of deceptive? No, this was a woman who had a, a word from God that said the younger uh, will, uh, will actually rule over the older. God told this couple, Isaac and Rebecca, when the babies were still in the womb, remember they were twins, this is how, how it's going to be. Uh, culture says this, you may want to do this, but I'm telling you, it's the younger that's going to rule over the older and not the other way around. Isaac got towards the end of his life and said, I don't care what God said. I like this kid better. I'm giving my blessing to him. Rebecca says, that ain't happening in this house. We're going along with God on this. If I got to do this, I'm doing it. Jacob, you get in there and do what I tell you to do. And he did. He obeyed his mother and did that and obeyed the word of God. So that's a little different perspective on that story, isn't it? <laughs> the only time Jacob is called a, a deceiver is by Esau. Why? His heart was full of bitterness against his brother. Uh, again, he sold his birthright for, uh, for lentil soup. Of course, if he had bought it at Whole Foods, it would have cost quite a bit. But uh, <laughs> they got some pretty good lentil soup down there. <clears throat> I think they want $45 for it, though, but, uh, <laughs> somewhere around there. Get a coupon and knock it down to 39. <laughs> but uh, no, we, we, like, we like Whole Foods, but it's, uh, it's a little pricey. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but here he is. You know, he's, uh, again, he's the example of a guy that just becomes angry uh, because he regrets decisions in his life. Again, because we can look at this and say, well, he deserves it. Look what Jacob did. And I'm saying, uh, it's not what Jacob did, it's what Esau did. 
what he did to himself. And he was angry about it, and it became bitter, and he never dealt with it. Uh, and he becomes the, the example uh, of what can happen to us in terms, of, in terms of bitterness. Again, the writer of Hebrews, remember, says it's a bitter root. In other words, it, it, just, it just drives down. I can tell you what kind of root it is. It's a holicoa. Have you ever tried to take one of those trees out? That root goes straight, straight down. I mean, it's unbelievable to get those things. Uh, uh, when we bought our house it, it, in, in County Owing, <coughs> it had been a, a rental house. And the holicoa from the front yard grew up and touched the telephone wires. That uh, was a lot. took a lot to get that out of there. I always think about that. That's what bitterness does. Uh, and it gives a place for the devil to get in there uh, and make your life completely dysfunctional uh, and grieve the heart of God. Bitterness then leads to wrath. Wrath is an explosion uh, outside of the feelings, uh, the feelings being let go. Uh, it's described of Satan many, many times uh, in terms of his wrath. It also is translated rage because that's what happens. The anger is there. We don't deal with it. It becomes bitterness, and we don't deal with it. And then eventually, boom, we just we let, it, we let it fly verbally. Sometimes, of course, it's worse than that. We let it fly physically. Uh, again, anger is mentioned. Uh, now, this is a, 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 a Greek word that means the state of mind that seeks vengeance. Not just like uh, I'm, you know, I'm late for an appointment, and I'm angry I missed it, you know, or whatever. This is, this is an anger that seeks vengeance uh, against someone else. But Paul says in Romans 12, 9, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God says, let me deal with it. Uh, that person has wronged you. Uh, let, let, me, let me deal with it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just thought of an illustration. <clears throat> they were, so we were watching TV. I think Melissa was in the room, and uh, I don't know if I called Kathy. And I said, hey, you, you got to see this. A guy that uh, ripped me off for several thousand dollars several years ago, he was on TV. They just caught him embezzling like $100,000 from this business, and I think he's going to get punished for it. <laughs> God says, you know what, uh, I'll, I'll deal with these things uh, in, uh, in my time. <clears throat> you don't have to be angry. You don't have to be bitter. I'll take care of you. Just, just go on. You know, I provided for you uh, this far. What's a couple thousand bucks? Just leave it behind and move on. I'll deal with it. He says, vengeance is mine. Please don't take that away from me because he's pretty good at it. Uh, and it's payday someday for everybody. All these guys in ISIS and all these horrible things around the world, God will deal with every one of them. And, and the temptation, <clears throat> the temptation I think and currently for us is uh, we can be so uh, incensed in anger about the persecution of Christians in the Middle East and we should. What should we do? We should be praying. We should be praying for the deliverance, praying for God's grace to be upon them to endure whatever they can. We should, whatever we can, support uh, ministries like Samaritan's uh, Purse or our good friend Victor Marx has been over there uh, with his group counseling these young gals that are able to escape. There's horrific things that are going on. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, <coughs> the, main, the main group of people uh, that are coming against Christians in our own country trying to take away our religious freedoms happens happens to be homosexual activists over the issue of same-sex marriage. What should our response be to them? I, I love the, the response of this one gal who was, uh, uh, basic, basically lost her business, as, uh, her bakery business, uh, because she refused to do a, 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 a wedding cake for, for a same-sex marriage. She lost her business. She was losing her home. And they asked her on the news, what would you do if that person, who was one of her regular customers... But she, when she came in, she just explained she couldn't do that cake because of her Christian faith and values. Uh, but she recommended several other bakers that could probably, she thought would do an excellent job. She, they asked her, what would you do if that person came, uh, came uh, into your bakery today? She said, oh, well, I would just throw my arms around them and give them a hug. I haven't seen them in months. And I, I just want to get caught up and see how they're doing. That, that's a Christian response. Uh, but, but it's not going to be there if anger grows to bitterness and it just goes down in there. Eventually it's wrath uh, and eventually it becomes a type of anger that leads to uh, vengeance. <clears throat> I heard the fourth one is clamor. That just means to cry out loud. It's the opposite of being silent. It's also translated brawling. Uh, and again, it's <clears throat> but it implies guilt on the part of the person 
that uh, basically is doing the, the crying out. <clears throat> I don't know whose water this is, and I'm thinking, but uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. It is ice water. <clears throat> I can tell that's not mine. I would never put ice in it. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> I won't be able to holler out or cry out at this point. But it's a huge problem in marriages. <clears throat> kind of get our train of thought back here again. This. Uh, this idea of crying out implies guilt on the person that's doing the crying out. You feel guilty, so then when you're confronted, you, you let the other person have it <laughs> because, because you, you don't want to deal with your own heart. Uh, that, that's the issue here. And when we do these things, we're, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. Evil speaking, NIV translates it's uh, slander. It means to verbally attack and verbally abuse uh, another person's and all these things again grieve the Holy Spirit now here's the here's the motivation that Paul's concerned about right at the end of verse 31 with all malice this means a desire to do evil to others and it's rooted in pride it speaks of corruption that's on the inside it's the opposite you know a lot of Greek words that, that have an opposite it's the opposite of the word that's translated gentleness uh, and Jesus again I uh, made reference to this a few weeks ago. Uh, it's the only autobiographical statement that we have of, of Jesus. This is what Jesus says about himself uh, in, uh, in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And this is what Jesus says about himself. For I am gentle. That's our word. That is the opposite of this word malice. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls uh, if you want to be a, as, as far apart of what it should be to be like Christ as a Christian uh, then you'll do things with malice it's the opposite of the attitude of Jesus it's rooted in pride it's a desire for evil uh, against others again the Holy Spirit lives in every Christian and when we do these things we grieve the spirit of God the Holy Spirit cannot leave us he will not leave us. Uh, he sealed us until the day of redemption. We will not lose our salvation over any of these things, but we'll certainly lose the joy of our salvation and we'll lose the, the fullness of the blessing of God uh, uh, upon our lives. These things are all prevalent in our culture. Uh, that's what I'm saying. It's because you'll have no problem finding somebody worse than you. I just tell a little white lie once in a while. Man, these guys at work, they are off the charts. See, it's, it's, it's so prevalent uh, that you, you could be committing these sins and still look pretty good <laughs> compared, compared to the people that uh, uh, you're, you're with in your neighborhood and uh, in working uh, every day. But that's not the issue. Uh, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Six, we should respond to others with kindness and forgiveness. That's in verse 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, uh, even as God in Christ forgave you. So we should always respond in kindness, uh, being tenderhearted, of course, giving us the reason because of what Christ has uh, uh, done for us. This means acting with genuine concern. Uh, we should always forgive. Secondly, since Christ forgave us, uh, and the word uh, forgive here, actually in a Greek, is not the word that's normally translated uh, forgive. It's the word grace. Uh, we, we could... Uh, uh, really translate verse 32 and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, gracing one another, even as God in Christ graced you. And of course, that's one of Paul's themes. We're saved by grace through faith. This is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. The gift is God's grace. God, in his grace, has forgiven us. So, you know, properly translated forgiveness there. But it's the idea of a God giving us what we don't deserve, his unmerited favor to us. And he says, this is why we should be forgiving uh, to others. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, and uh, and, I, and you know, I obviously, could, we could stop and do six weeks just on the issue of forgiveness. Um, uh, just to, and real short to try, to try to help you with this issue that because we've spent some time on it in the past. <clears throat> Go back and read about Joseph because Joseph, Joseph tells you how. Uh, Joseph is sold into slavery. I don't know if you had any bad things happen to you. He's sold into slavery by, by his brothers. As far as they know, he's going to get killed. I mean, that's pretty bad. And, uh, and yet Joseph is, uh, is able to work through his anger 
He's able to not become bitter, uh, and he's able to forgive uh, his brothers. Uh, because, just uh, two things to think about it, he always believed that, uh, that God was uh, uh, in charge. He always believed that God was with him, uh, and God had a purpose for this uh, happening to him. He always believed that. Of course, he had, he, had, he had the word of God in a dream that said, one day your brothers will bow before you. You'll see them one day. How will you act when you see them? And we know by the names he named his kids, uh, they're honoring the Lord, uh, being raised to this uh, position of prime minister. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't, God doesn't use him in that way if he's an angry young guy. He, he is not. Uh, and uh, he is the classic example, if you study of his life, how to get over it. Uh, Stephen, we've done another message on Stephen. Stephen in the New Testament, who is martyr, the first martyr uh, of the church, who is forgiving those that are killing him. That shows you the power, the power of forgiveness. Because a man named Saul of Tarsus watched that, and it touched his heart. And he was a cruel man. But to see somebody forgive someone who doesn't deserve it uh, is powerful. Uh, but I would just recommend those two, those two things for you uh, uh, to look at uh, on your own. I just want to close with this one illustration. I thought it was very interesting. It's an AP story entitled The Danger of Hydraulic Fluid. And, uh, and I'll just read it. It happens at Duke University. I hate to kind of throw a shadow over their, their current uh, NCAA win, but uh, Duke University Hospital in Raleigh. Uh, uh, it was in 2004. Maintenance workers had drained hydraulic fluid from the hospital elevators uh, and emptied them into detergent drums, uh, but they didn't get rid of the drums. And through a strange series of events, the drums were mistakenly redistributed to people who cleaned surgical instruments. It took two months and 3,800 surgeries before anyone figured out what was wrong. Washing the instruments in hydraulic fluid was not an effective means of sterilization. No kidding. The biggest question is, what kind of damage had been done to the patients? Uh, no one was sure what the petroleum residue might do to people. The hospital's head honcho assured the public, we want to give the people uh, the message that we care about our patients. <laughs> and no doubt they do. Uh, but if their instruments weren't safe, uh, they were a threat to the patients no matter how much they cared. A church careless about holiness is like that. We may care about our people, but we're in danger to them nonetheless. Uh, it isn't enough to share the gospel with the lost. We must also be sure we act in holy ways and teach holiness as a way of life, lest we harm uh, the people of God. It's not enough to just care. I think all of us care about people that don't know the Lord. Uh, but we can care all we want. Uh, but there's nothing different about our lives and their lives. Well, we just, if you think about that balance in being, we're not worthy. We're not walking in a way that's worthy. Uh, but when we are, we're not grieving the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's blessing our lives, and he can use us to impact the lives of others. These aren't, uh, you know, there's just like five things here. And uh, some of you are thinking, can we go back to the theology for a while? It's interesting, you know, Paul, everything is front-loaded with theology. I wish these messages were more practical. You know, and then you get to the practical part. I sure wish they were a little more theological, you know, because, because we step under each other, you know, toes. And, uh, uh, but uh, we're going to have communion now, so this is the time to repent. What does that mean? You change your mind. Uh, you think about your own heart, because you're going to take two symbols that represent the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to do this in remembrance of him. Uh, and Paul instructs uh, the church in, uh, in Corinthians uh, to, you know what, you, you need to make sure your heart is right before God before you do this. Uh, so as I pray, let's all pray. Uh, allow the Holy Spirit to convict and show us uh, that we might change our hearts and minds. Uh, that then that would lead to a changed uh, behavior.